Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 211 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all things FCPA compliance related. Today I have with me, with me Matthew Stevenson. Matthew is a professor at Harvard School of Law in Matthew is the founder of the Global Anti-Corruption Group. Uh, it is one of the top academic blogs around anti-corruption, and he talks to us about his reasons for founding the blog, some of the uh, topics that uh, really uh, garnered his interest, and really some of the different uh, things that have happened in his editorship of the blog that he was really not expecting. The episode comes in at just over... 23 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I'm extraordinarily pleased to have Professor Matthew Stevenson from Harvard University School of Law visiting with us. He is the founder of the Global Anti-Corruption blog, and he is going to visit with us today about his blog and uh, see what else might be on his mind. So with that, Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really wanted to, I've uh, been wanting to, frankly, for a long time, visit with you about your blog. I thought it slid into a place that, that we needed, um, there was a gap in coverage. If I, I've got insurance on my mind, so I'll use that phrase, mm-hmm. about uh, where uh, sort of an academic focus on corruption, and I think you have done a fabulous job on that. You write on a very regular basis, but you have a wide variety of other commentators from, frankly, across the globe who talked to us about this subject. So uh, can you tell us what led you to found the blog and uh, what you hope to accomplish with it? Well, like you, I thought that, that maybe there was a bit of, as you put it, a gap in coverage. There are obviously many forums online and offline where people discuss corruption issues, but I didn't see in the corruption or development blogosphere anything uh, quite like what what I had in mind that I thought would be useful. The real idea for doing the blog actually came from a colleague of mine, Professor Jack Goldsmith, with whom I taught a seminar a few years back on transnational anti-bribery laws. And uh, Jack, Professor Goldsmith, uh, runs a couple of blogs or co-runs a couple of blogs, one on law and national security issues and one on labor law issues. Um, the former is called Lawfare and the latter is called On Labor. And uh, based on our conversations that we had after the course, he thought that it would be very useful to try to establish something similar for the world of anti-corruption and encouraged me to explore that possibility. And I looked into it. And again, there were many very useful online resources Uh, There's obviously the sorts of things that you've done, Uh, there's the FCPA blog, there are a number of others, but there didn't seem to be anything that that was really, um, how should I put this, there were a lot of blogs that were very much focused on uh, FCPA and legal compliance issues, and there were some uh, good blogs that NGOs ran about their own projects or about development issues more generally, but I was really uh, hoping to create something that would be a little bit more broad-ranging in terms of topics and uh, really to try to build more of a bridge of communication between the world of academics and practitioners. That was very much on my mind when I uh, tried to set this up, that there would be a way uh, for those communities to engage in a serious and sustained dialogue to be able to have a forum where one could talk about developments in academic research in ways that would be uh, relevant and interesting to people doing practical work, policymaking work, advocacy work, and, and so forth. And that was really the thinking behind it. Well, I really have appreciated the uh, sort of policy component, particularly around the NGOs. And I think you're right that uh, they would publicize certain issues that uh, they would find uh, appropriate to, to their own sphere, but you brought that to a larger audience and uh, to the day-to-day compliance practitioner to consider and to help uh, further the dialogue along. So I've really enjoyed that part of it. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, I guess uh, you have a wide variety of commentators. Uh, It looks like Mm -hmm. you have a few folks who comment on a regular basis. I don't say comment, I mean post uh, or guest post on a regular basis. But you also have a fair number of guest posts, it looks like, just from names I don't recognize, up to and including students. Yes, absolutely. So 
the blog, in addition to myself, uh, there's uh, one other non-student professional person uh, who's a regular contributor. My friend and actually actual former boss, Rick Messick, who okay. used to work for the World Bank. I was actually his research assistant back when I was a graduate student. Um, and and he, I thought, would be a perfect person to get involved in this project, especially because, as I said, one of the objectives of the blog was to build bridges between the world of, of academic research and the world of practice. And I'm very much situated in the world of academic research. Rick is very much in the world of practice. He worked for the World Bank for a long time. He now does a lot of independent uh, governance consulting. And so he's a regular contributor. We also have been fortunate enough to have a, a, a number of uh, excellent guest contributors from the NGO world, for example, people from Transparency International or the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption uh, or a number of other organizations, uh, other scholars, uh, and, and so forth. Sometimes uh, the guest posts uh, are people that, that Rick or I have, have um, uh, people that we've solicited, someone who's got, makes an interesting presentation at a conference or gives an interesting paper, we'll, we'll invite those people to contribute to the blog. On some occasions, we've gotten excellent guest posts just from people who read the blog and follow it, um, like you and maybe some of some of your listeners out there, uh, and have something that they think would be an appropriate contribution. And then, as you say, one of the great resources that I have here at Harvard Law School is an absolutely outstanding student body, of really, really top-notch people, and they're really smart. Uh, and also, it turns out many of them come to law school with amazing experience. You know, not a lot of it. They're relatively young, but people have worked all over the world on all sorts of interesting projects. And I really made an effort early on to get a group of students involved in working on the blog and to give them an opportunity to do the kinds of serious research that they would do for an ordinary class, but instead of writing a paper that would be read pretty much only by me and given a grade, they have now the opportunity to write for a larger audience. And of course, I work with them closely with respect to selecting their topics and editing their pieces. Uh, we meet regularly for the students to give one another feedback. But it's actually been nice uh, both for generating content for the blog, but also allowing it to serve as a kind of um, educational and pedagogical opportunity for these extraordinary students who are very excited about both learning about corruption and also actively helping to fight against it. So that's been great as well. You know, and I would only add that uh, it's brought a, a level of dialogue and discourse to people like myself that I would never have the opportunity to read a student paper unless it was published as a note or in some other academic journal. And, and the chances of one getting pu uh, published and two me reading it are, are lesser as it, as it goes further out. But having a, a student write a guest blog post, uh, with uh, your guidance and, and feedback has really been a boon to, I think, the compliance practitioner and certainly someone like myself. Well, that's, that's I'm thrilled to hear that. <laughs> I will relay that back to my students, so I think we'll receive a huge morale boost to hear that. Um, no, it's, it's absolutely true, and oftentimes the students uh, write longer papers as well, write really good longer papers, but you know, the chances of them getting published uh, are, are relatively low, and even if they are, the chances of a very busy practitioner reading a student article published in a law journal somewhere are pretty low, uh, but the students can condense their main arguments and ideas into a few paragraphs and get them out of the blog. It, very much the idea of the, of the platform is uh, to share some of these ideas with a wider audience. And for those people who are interested and want to learn more, again, the great thing about blogs and online platforms of that sort is you can provide links, you can provide citations. So if people want to dig deeper, uh, they can. But but what you describe, it makes me very happy because it's very much uh, the objective that I had in mind when I set out uh, with this enterprise. And it's, it's precisely to be able to, to raise the quality of the discourse by you know, allowing smart people to talk to other smart people when, when everybody's busy and people are coming from different backgrounds. So has anything, uh, uh, has it gone in a direction that has surprised you? Or uh, maybe the question would be, what's the most surprising thing that uh, has come up for you since you founded and, and started the blog? Well, I would say that the most surprising thing, which is also a source of happiness, is that we seem to have found an audience and I'm still doing this. I wasn't sure when I started if it would last more than a couple of weeks and then, and then flame out. So that's been an extremely pleasant surprise. Uh, I suppose, you know, it, it's also, I think the opportunity of doing the blog has, has it surprised me how much of an 
unmet need there does seem to be for opportunities for serious dialogue and engagement and, and critical dialogue and, engage, and engagement between different people for, with different backgrounds working on these issues. I certainly don't think that my little blog is, is uh, satiating that very large unmet need. Um, so I think that's a sign that, that the communities generally need, need to do more. Because there's so many people who work on corruption and anti-corruption and care about it a lot, but people are busy and we're all in our own little worlds and you're often not aware of what's happening elsewhere and the, other, and the things that other people are working on that, that might be of interest. And, and I, I think that that's, um, that was a little bit of a surprise uh, and it points to the need for, I think, more efforts by a lot of people using a lot of different um, media and forums and techniques to, to increase the, both the quantity and the quality of communication. How, uh, you mentioned that the blog is part of your ongoing academic ef efforts. Could you tell us uh, what, what you teach or what academic efforts the blog supports and vice versa? Sure. Well, in terms of my, my kind of regular teaching, other than the course that's closely associated with the blog or occasional courses like the one I do with, professional, uh, with, with Professor Goldsmith, uh, on transnational bribery. Most of my teaching is not directly corruption related. I teach a, our, a lot of our basic courses on statutory interpretation and administrative law. Um, but I would say the larger academic research project that I'm working on right now is very much thematically connected to the blog and actually what I was just talking about a moment ago. And that's that there's so much academic research on corruption. And when I say academic, I don't just mean done by university professors, also think tanks and institutions like the World Bank or uh, USAID or the UN or so forth. So much research out there on this topic, you know, corruption's causes, its consequences, possible strategies for addressing it and so forth. Um, but there's not, in my view, uh, very much out there that really synthesizes, really brings together this body of work in a way that would make it terribly effective for people in the practitioner community, advocates, policymakers, even people, lawyers or people in, in the private sector and so forth. And so what I'm hoping to do over the next few years is to really go through this substantial body of literature and try to pull it together and figure out what do we actually know? What does the evidence actually say? And where are there important gaps in our knowledge base? And what, what, what are there, what are, what's out there that maybe we think we don't know, but actually researchers showed us some pretty good answers? And what's out there where maybe people think they know, um, but it turns out that the evidentiary basis for some of our beliefs is a lot thinner than, than we might hope. Um, so that's, that project's still at a very early stage, uh, but it's very much connected uh, with the blog. Uh, they're both efforts to try to increase, improve channels of communication between the world of research and the world of practice. They do it in very different ways. The blog is obviously kind of pretty quick off the cuff commentary on things that are happening in the world or things that people are saying, whereas the academic project is a much more long-term uh, attempt to dig deeply into the research. But they're, they're connected in the sense that I just, I just mentioned. Well, I absolutely applaud that effort because I do see a very distinct gap in uh, that, uh, pulling that together. And I think about that often. And I, every time I try to think about how could one do that, I give up because I can't even consider how, I, I, how one person or a group of people could begin to pull that information together just to even see what we have and what we don't have. Yeah, it's it's a it's monumentally time consuming. Uh, this this is one of the benefits of being a tenured professor at a research university. I mean, this is in all seriousness. You know, the tenure system has all sorts of pathologies that people like to make fun of all the time, and I make fun of them myself. Um, but in addition to protecting people who might be doing politically controversial work, which is, doesn't really apply to me. The other uh, benefit of the tenure system, what it's supposed to do, is to give people the luxury of time to really delve into a topic in depth in ways where it's not clear exactly what the payoff will be or when it will kick in, um, but without the pressure that most people, for good reasons, face in their regular jobs of deadlines and clients and, and, and getting things done. So I, I like to think that uh, I'm, I'm using the, the tenure system as, as it's meant to be used. Um, and the hope is that if I manage to do this, and I won't, I won't do it all on my own. I'm trying to get it started on my own. But the hope is that eventually uh, 
the group of people who I have helping me with this, and, and, and obviously myself as well, will be able to put together a resource that will be useful for people in the world uh, so that other people won't have to go through it, and it will be a lot easier to keep updated than it will to create in the first place. But, uh, that's a great project, and as the son of a retired tenured professor, I completely get it. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, if I could turn to a couple of uh, other things. Um, sure. One of the things that I particularly enjoyed is, uh, probably because I agree with you so much, is some of your thoughts around um, having a compliance defense appended yep. to the FCPA. And uh, as, as with the differences between us, I try to talk about so why some of the practical reasons I don't think uh, you should have one, but you, you really delve into some of the policy reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm always very fascinated by uh, that because it, it seems to come up, uh, I don't want to say regularly, but certainly two, three times a year I've, I've seen you write about that and uh, it just continues to come up. Is um, Are there other areas that have really uh, interested you or you've written on as much as that area, or is that just because the debate seems to be ongoing? Yeah, there are a few. So that's one. Uh, that's one of the areas where, and this is actually what the blog format is really useful for. I wouldn't have written a 40-page law review article on the compliance defense. This is not something that's enough of a focus of my research, but you know, it, it constantly shows up on the sort of wish list of, of the FCPA reform crowd. It gets a lot of discussion. and. Just thinking about it, and there were a lot of aspects of it that didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to me, and so it was something I felt like writing about, and that provoked a little bit of a response. And so, yeah, we've, we've had a few uh, posts specifically on that topic. Of the FCPA-related topics that I've written on, that one's probably one of the ones that's come up a bunch. I would say another topic that I've addressed frequently on the blog and a few other contributors have as well has to do not so much with the legal issues, but issues of measurement, especially at the national or cross-country level in terms of the degree of corruption or perceived corruption. There are issues, for example, about whether one can measure a country's progress in reducing corruption or it's backsliding the other direction by looking at the change in the country, country's annual uh, score on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. So I've written a bit about that. I'm one of the people who's very critical of using year-to-year -year changes in Corruption Perception Index scores to measure uh, changes even in perceived corruption. Uh, and that's even though I'm actually much more sympathetic than some other people, including my collaborator Rick Messick, in terms of the usefulness of the Transparency International Index overall. I have noted um, that. <laughs> yeah, but but I but I've um, but I, I've I've expressed some some considerable skepticism about the way uh, it's sometimes used to say, well, this country and things are getting better in this country, things are getting worse. We've had oh we've had uh, a bunch of other topics they kind of I guess they kind of come come and go a bit. I remember a little while ago uh, I was writing a little bit about again this would be a topic sort of near and dear to my heart anti-corruption education and what we think the role is of educational institutions universities or otherwise um, in in uh, addressing corruption. Uh, Oh gosh! If I probably if I went back if I went back through the archives of posts, other things would 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 uh, spring up. But those are those are a few of the things we've written about in the blog. And one of the nice things about the format is you really can bounce around a bit. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. a full-time yeah. FCPA lawyer, but I'm interested in the FCPA. But I'm also interested in some of the broader political economy of development issues. You know, the background in political science as well as in law. And so I can kind of be a little bit, little bit of a corruption dilettante in, in whatever issues seem to be coming up. Oh, I suppose another issue that we've deb debated quite a bit on the blog and where I've, I've participated in a number of conferences and public debates has to do with various proposals to create some kind of international anti-corruption court. Um, yes. So, for example, Judge Mark Wolf, a former chief judge and, and still judge of the uh, federal court in the District of Massachusetts, has emerged as a major advocate of the creation of some kind of international anti-corruption court along the lines of the International Criminal Court, though in his view it would be a separate institution. And I read Judge Wolf's proposal and I was uh, skeptical and I wrote a blog post that was uh, critical of the proposal and he and I have now 
I think for something like three times participated in some kind of conference or forum or panel where we've been debating, sometimes just the two of us, sometimes more of us, uh, this proposal. And there have been a number of other contributions to the blog that have weighed in on these proposals as well. Uh, because quite naturally, when people get very frustrated about corruption, especially in places where it seems so pervasive and affects the justice system as well as other parts of government, that it, it seems hopeless and, and leads many people, uh, I think again for good reason, to search for solutions that maybe go outside of the existing institutions. And I, I'm sympathetic with the impulse, but very skeptical of the particular proposal. So that's another topic where I think our, our blog has had uh, quite a number of contributions. One of the, I think, fabulous resources you brought to bear is something called the Bibliography on Corruption and Anti-Corruption uh, mm -hmm. that you uh, publish and you update on a regular basis. Uh, yes. I was trying to figure out how many pages it is, and all I can figure out is a lot. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about this resource? And, and uh, really, anyone listening needs to, to go to your blog just for this resource alone. It's oh, absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. It's actually directly connected to the project uh, that I mentioned a few moments ago where I'm trying uh -huh. to synthesize the anti-corruption literature. It's that bibliography that I'm hoping to synthesize. And of course, it grows every month. I do a, a one post in the blog per month. is just an update of the bibli bibliography. But the origins of that uh, project really connects the origins of the blog and, and, and the synthesis project as well. About five or so years ago, when I decided I wanted to focus on anti-corruption uh, as a topic, I'd been doing administrative law for about five years, but I'd already, always had an interest in, in law and development, broadly speaking, but, but particularly anti-corruption. I did what I thought you're supposed to do as a responsible scholar, and I said, well, the first thing I should do is I should read the literature. I should familiarize myself with the existing academic literature. I'm not an expert in this topic yet. I should first read what other people have written. So I made myself a little reading list, and it was originally just for my own personal use. And yeah, I looked at syllabi I found on the web, or I uh, looked up articles that had corruption in the title, or, or I did various other things. And I put together a little reading list. It was about 20 pages long. And I said, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'll just read all the articles on my 20-page reading list, and then I'll know the literature, and then I'll start thinking about what I, what I want to contribute myself. And as I did this, the reading list got longer and longer. I would read an article, and I would notice it would cite three or four articles that looked important that weren't on my list, or I would come across something new on the web or in the news or um, wherever. And so the, the, um, the list, the bibliography that originally started just as my own reading list started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I realized there's, it's going to take forever to read all this. Um, and then that was what really got me thinking. It would take anyone a ton of time to read all this. Someone's got to find a way to pull all this material together. And I haven't done it yet. I haven't figured out if it's actually going to be feasible. Um, but that bibliography that you referenced that's now I think got about some point, over 4,000 sources on it, it's over 300 pages long, started five years ago just as my own personal reading list. And once it got big enough, I realized that to the best of my knowledge, I have the most comprehensive bibliography, at least of English language materials on corruption and anti-corruption. I should just put it up on my faculty website and mention it on the blog and actually use the blog uh, as a way to solicit more contributions. And that's actually worked. Occasionally, I'll get emails from people who've seen it on the blog and say, hey, here are a few other papers that you, haven't, that you don't have in your bibliography that you should, you should really add. So yeah, that's where, that, that's where that comes from. And it's on my faculty web page. And I update it every month and put, post a little announcement on the blog. And it's, it's supposed to be a resource. Um, because of its origins, it's, it's not as organized as efficiently as, as I would have liked if I'd known what I, what I was getting into when I started. It's just a, basically a Word document that I convert into a PDF. So it's not annotated or keywords. It's not organized in a database. One of these days, I'm going to have someone in our, in our uh, technology services uh, unit here at, at Harvard Law School help me transfer this uh, into, into some format that will make it more usable. Um, but yeah, but that's, the, that's the origin story for the bibliography. Well, it's a fabulous resource, so uh, thank you very much just for doing that. Oh, no, my, my pleasure. I'm glad, I'm glad that it's, it, it will be useful for someone other than me. Uh, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but uh, could you tell uh, any listeners who are not familiar with the blog where they might find it and how they might contact you? Absolutely. 
The URL for the blog is just globalanticorruptionblog.com. Uh, no hyphens, no spaces, just global anti-corruption blog, as one word, dot com. You can also find us on Twitter at at symbol anti-corrupt blog, capital A and capital B, otherwise one word. And you can follow us, uh, I've, uh, you can follow the blog either by signing up for email alerts on the blog or just by following us on Twitter. Um, my name again is Matthew Stevenson, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-O-N. I've got a web page on the Harvard Law School uh, website, which is, uh, you can just go to www.law.harvard.edu and find me on the faculty list. There you can find my CV as well as links to the giant anti-corruption corruption bibliography and to the blog. And my contact information is all there as well, and I'm always happy to hear from people interested in corruption, anti-corruption, or anything related. Well, thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Hello again. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two calls to action for you. If you could go to iTunes and rate this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. The second thing is, if you have any questions you would like answered, please uh, send me an email. I'm developing a next uh, mailbag episode. I'd love to be able to uh, answer your question on a podcast. So thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation.